origin stories. Deadpool is an origin story through and through. This is unfortunate because origin stories suck and shouldn't be a thing. You know why? Because they're not real stories. That's why they have to tack origin onto it to trick you into thinking they are. But deep down, we all know they're a framing device separating us from the real deal, like the chocolate wafers to an Oreo. No more Oreos! So why are origin stories a thing? Two words. Emotional high. Because the main plot of the movie ain't enough to keep these oversized children in their seats, well, you've got to throw in some prior tragedy. In the case of, say, Spider-Man, the movies, it's by killing Uncle Ben and laying some of the blame on Peter. The main plot is never about Uncle Ben or Peter's relationship with him or even getting revenge for Uncle Ben. It's just a stepping stone in the main storyline, which is about beating up some mutated green guy who wants to kill Spider-Man really, really badly for no especially concrete reason. Every time they reboot Spider-Man, they include the Uncle Ben origin story, even though everyone's in their theater seats already perversely anticipating his death. Stay back. Stay back. Daddy. Why do they do this? Because Spider-Man's really fucking boring without it. Sans that, he's got no reason to do anything. He has no higher goals except maybe to bang Mary Jane or Gwen Stacy or whomever the fuck. He doesn't give two shits about the Green Goblin in the Sam Raimi films. He doesn't put a whole lot of effort into finding his parents' killers in the Amazing Spider-Man films. There's just no emotional investment. Unless you set aside a handful of scenes to kill a loved one. Because then it's personal. Because then there's an emotional high to disguise that lack of emotional investment in the main story. Marvel is a terrible offender of this. By the time we got to the Avengers, the heroes were all left hanging around with nothing to do. Iron Man didn't give a shit anymore about the proliferation of weapons, like what drove him in his origin story. Thor only mentioned something in passing about Natalie Portman, who was his focus in his origin story. Captain America didn't have any more Nazis to defeat, and his love interest was probably in an old folks home. And nobody cares about the Hulk. Hulk crushed. These heroes' stories just didn't matter anymore, but they certainly made these characters seem deeper and more three-dimensional than they would be otherwise. And this was, of course, Marvel's plan all along. They draw you in with a little bit of emotional investment, and then they completely abandon it for a blockbuster spectacle. And then introduce some more investment, and then abandon it for a blockbuster spectacle. Ad infinitum. Congrats, Marvel. You have figured it out. Deadpool is more of the same, only it's done in conjunction with 20th Century Fox. They're drawing you in now, but the plot elements of this movie will be all but gone by the sequel, I guarantee fucking T. It. Francis, or Ajax, will be meaningless in the grand scheme of things. Deadpool will be completely over his unbangability, Wade's cancer is never being brought up again, except maybe as a one-liner or two. So honestly, his past never needed to be shown or told. It doesn't inform us of anything significant enough to carry a larger narrative. I know nearly as much about Deadpool now as when he jumped off a bridge to murder a bunch of mercenaries at the start, but now I know it's because he wanted his boyish good looks restored. You could have flashed that Kruger face at us for five fucking seconds and I would have caught your drift movie. Real quick, let's go over One Punch Man's origin story, which, by the way, lasts under five minutes. Three years prior to the show's timeline, Saitama is just a young man looking for work and having a rough time of it. In his area, there's a monster menacing the city folk, a giant half-crab man in his tidy whities named Crablante. How did this malformed atrocity of man and crab come to be? Some guy ate too much crab. President of the Bullies Club, I command you to leave. This guy is too mean to mess with. When Saitama runs across Crab Blonte, he doesn't run away in fear. Why should he? He can't find neither a job nor a reason to live. Crab Blonte even makes a point to call out Saitama's lifeless eyes, just like his, which is why he spares him, saying he already has a target. Some big chinned brat who drew nipples on him with permanent marker and the fucker can't wipe it off because he has claws for hands. Fast forward and Saitama coincidentally runs across that big chinned brat who's got a fucking ball sack on the end of his face. The kid's so uncute that Saitama contemplates just walking away, but he saves him by impulse when Crablante shows up out of nowhere. In a clever use of fourth wall breaking, Saitama laughs at Crablante's ensuing monologue because he reminds him of a villain from an anime he used to watch. Saitama doesn't then turn to the screen and shoot finger guns though. Instead, an infuriated Crablante brutally whips him across the playground for his impudence. Saitama gets back up, there are a few great lines about how he can't let the boy die because of declining birth rates and how he never wanted to be a salaryman, but a hero. He gets roughed up a bit and then he kills Kreblante by ripping out his internal organs through his eye socket with his tie. Deadpool's gore has got nothing on this. We flash forward again with Saitama breaking the fourth wall, I mean narrating, that he trained so hard from that day on he gained all the power and lost 
all his hair. So remember, One Punch Man achieves in under 5 minutes from a 12 episode TV show what Deadpool takes about an hour to fail to do in a movie. Saitama's flashback informs us of who Saitama was, a man despairing his own powerlessness to the man he became, a man despairing how overpowered he is. One Punch Man even has several scenes devoted to mocking origin stories, the most prominent of which being when the cyborg Genos exposits his tragic past to an increasingly frustrated Saitama, and it all culminates in Saitama losing his cool and shouting that Genos shut up and limit his descriptions to 20 words or less. Genos's verbosity and Saitama's outbursts are funny because we get that frustration. We're so damn used to being given these exhaustively detailed backstories for characters that last so long, the main story is essentially on pause until they're finished. A story that requires a pause button can't be all that exciting, can it? But because they've become such a fixture in so much storytelling, we endure it. So when a character like Genos launches into his comically emphatic backstory, and Saitama eventually snaps, well, it's funny cause it's true, and One Punch Man is true to its word. Backstories are brief and to the point, and Saitama and best girl Genos make damn sure of it. This is smart. Less is usually more, and more importantly, it's not too much. Deadpool on the other hand does the opposite, and gives us mostly backstory. Simultaneously destroying any mystique the character of Deadpool had. After the terrific scene on the bridge, we have to put the movie on pause because, didn't you know, Deadpool has superpowers and you really need to know how he got them in painfully drawn out detail. It's so boring! Deadpool has a girlfriend and you need to know how they met and how she fucks him in the ass. That's so gay! Hello, you faggot! So you're a queer, aren't you? Bad queer! Deadpool's upset about his face, and he's not really the detached commentator you were led to believe he was. Not at all. Bugger! Watching this movie gave me PTSD flashbacks of Mad Max Teen Feels Road, <laughs> because both competently introduced their characters, but then proceed to tear them down. Only at least Feels Road had the decency to do it in real time. Deadpool should have been titled The Flash. Back. What up, Max? How are you? Here's your Flash. Back. Thanks. No problem. In conclusion, origin stories aren't only about cancer, they are cancer. Setting. I have a confession to make. I don't like the superhero genre. <laughs> For the most part, I just don't get it. Why do only retarded cosplayers get powers or crazy abundant resources? And why don't they ever use their powers to take out the root of their problems instead of going after petty thieves all the time? Unless you're Saitama where you literally have to find petty thieves to take down to retain your licensed hero status. But take, for instance, the case of Batman. Bruce Wayne's a billionaire playboy philanthropist in Gotham City. After witnessing the murder of his parents, he swears vengeance on evildoers and Instead of using his tremendous wealth and influence to fix Gotham City's corruption and rampant crime, he dresses up like a bat and waits on street corners to swoop down and mug the shit out of muggers. But he won't kill them, except in Batman vs. Superman, so it's okay. In reality, Bruce Wayne comes off as a violent sociopath, rich enough to beat up on other violent sociopaths with no legal repercussions. This is kinda hilarious, except every Batman adaptation I've seen plays this completely straight. Look, I'm not asking for hyper-realistic standards from comic book heroes or anything, but let's be honest, the Joker has nothing on old Brucey boy. You're just a freak. Like me. This is why, out of all the Marvel movies, I like the first Iron Man the best. Because it's just about an industrialist who gets ass blasted by some Afghanis. So he builds a robot suit and blows the towel heads the fuck out. It's hilarious. Fuck that ending though. But I digress. Here's my main issue with the superhero genre. The setting never makes sense. Why doesn't the world ever give a shit that they're constantly getting attacked by monsters and aliens and supervillains? Why don't they start mounting their own defenses? Superheroes are clearly for cleanup duty because by the time they arrive on scene, everything is a fucking mess already. So why don't these universes ever invest in preventative measures? Superheroes make people so goddamn lazy. But I wanna die. You're getting really nitpicky, man. I realize that. But hear me out because I'm not asking for fully realized universes that effusively integrate great superheroes and monsters. I just want a little more done than, you know, nothing at all. Now, Deadpool takes place in the Marvel Universe, except not really, but since I don't read the comics, because why fucking would I, and I've barely seen any of the X-Men movies, because why fucking would I, we're gonna have to use the setting from the MCU movies for this one. Now, the Marvel Universe is chock full of superpowered freaks and equivalent superpowered monstrosities and threats, and it all seemingly takes place in our world. So what differences do these things make? Well, they have this Illuminati security 
Security Council of Holographic Talking Heads, Shield, Stark Industries, and yes, an approximation of our current geopolitical environment. But is any of this really connected to the regular, everyday people that supposedly populate the setting? That is to say, is any of it really connected to the world? Not really. Except when these people are being attacked. Then all of a sudden, S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Avengers and what have you step in and matter. They save a couple of faceless people, stop the bad guys, and then they're out of the picture again. But they don't really live among these people. They don't interact with them. They might as well be hanging out on the moon waiting to be called upon. We're on a helicarrier. The mortals worship you as a god. Man, I'm pretty. And this is kind of the point, actually. I know all of this is the core of the superhero fantasy. The desire to have gods swoop down and rescue us from ourselves. From those who seek to destroy us. And to willfully discard their own lives to prop up our failing, decadent societies. The ultimate in self-sacrifice. A higher power personified. In service of the weak. Of the feeble. For the sake of order and justice. But there's a subtly fascistic element to this too, as these gods, more often than not, uphold the laws of the society they are beholden to, and do so with or without the public's approval. When the public disapproves of their vigilantism, this is generally portrayed as foolishness or outright ignorance, because the hero knows what is truly best for them. And for some superhero fans, this is a self-insert fantasy, because what guy wouldn't want to kick society's dregs to the curb with insurmountable authoritarian force? That said, there is an implicit understanding that these gods are not us, no matter how relatable they're made out to be. They're either born with powers beyond the capacity of man, receive these powers but still accept the responsibility of becoming a savior, or they're filthy fucking rich. And that's all well and good, but it makes the world building fantastically boring, since the people will just leave everything up to their gods to handle and the gods will do it because... Uh, why not? Age of Ultron kinda had a neat idea going where Tony dares to suggest, hey let's mount some actual defenses in case of another alien invasion, but then generic robot army. Winter Soldier had a similar idea with a dangerous anti-terrorist apparatus, but then Jewish super Nazis. You trying to tell me that this Jew Rip. is a Nazi? Marvel, what are you doing? Captain America Civil War would have been interesting if Iron Man weren't so fucking unbelievably raw. But One Punch Man, of course, reverses this entirely. In a world where Japan is one giant supercontinent, they have fucking nationwide tryouts to become heroes. Everyday people train for the chance to be an officially recognized hero. Some everyday people are are heroes. One of them is the best. There are hero classes depending on ability, from S class, gods, to C class, dedicated cosplayers. There are early warning alarm systems for monster threats, rankings for disaster threat levels, and fortified anti-monster shelters for people to flock to. There's a shield equivalent, creatively named the Hero Association, staffed by regular looking people. And it's not like any of this is realistic, but One Punch Man is not aiming for that. It's just parodying a bunch of cities, literally named after alphabet letters, they're so disposable, responding to constant molestation by monsters. And with sheer parody, One Punch Man has a more realized universe than anything Marvel seems to offer with its bundle of holier-than-thou gods and token ass. waiting to descend from the clouds. One Punch Man takes its world building even further by having Saitama, well, actually live in it. Saitama is outwardly just like everybody else. He has to buy his own food at the local supermarket and keep tabs on when there are sales. Lives in an apartment in a dilapidated monster-infested part of town because rent is cheap. And he's that weirdo bald guy that people stare at in public. This city folk don't see him as a hero or even respect him, instead going as far as to call on other heroes to deal with him like he's a deranged lunatic. He's not anything like a higher ideal. He's just a freak in a cape who happens to routinely save everyone's asses. Deadpool is not totally dissimilar. He also lives in a cheap ass apartment and is even seen as a pest by his blind landlady. He goes to the laundromat and he has to take taxis to get to his bad guy beatdowns. Over the span of the film, he even develops a relationship with the Indian cab driver he uses as a chauffeur. These bits are good, if a bit overwritten by a lot, but they lead me to believe that the writers had some idea of what they were doing. But it's when we go a little deeper that One Punch Man and Deadpool settings really diverge. Let's take these scenes from them respectively, where Saitama jumps in at the last minute to punch out a freak meteor, and where Deadpool attacks the convoy of cars on the bridge. Not exactly equivalent scenarios, but they're important events in both narratives. Now when the meteor's on the approach to City Z in One Punch Man, the Heroes Association is trying to bring in whatever heroes are in the area to stop it. The early warning alarm system is going off, and people are trying to get out of the city in a panic, but in reality, City Z has been written off. The city folk have been, more or less, left to die. Genos is not content to leave these people to their fate and attempts to stop the meteor himself, but in the end, and he alone can't do anything. So when all hope is lost, Saitama shows up at the timing of any good superhero and one punches the shit out of that meteor. All's well that ends well. 
except for the meteor debris which showers down on the city and leaves it partly in ruins. Afterward, the public is goaded into placing the blame on and harassing Saitama for it. And all the while, this arc is used to introduce and develop several characters. Cause. Effect. Cause. Effect. Now, when Deadpool takes out the convoy, killing the baddies and probably a few innocents in the process, well... Nothing happens. The police don't show. The army doesn't show. S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't show. Not that they legally could. Only Colossus pops up with Negasonic Teenage Warhead in tow because he saw DP on the news while he was eating a cereal, which is kind of funny. But other than this newscast, there's no response from the setting. Deadpool's not hunted down by the authorities for being a crazy psychopath smashing up an interstate highway. He's not made into public enemy number one, or even acknowledged as a criminal, or at least dangerous. Colossus just lectures him a bit, like only he, the Xavier School and Deadpool are all that truly exist. Cause... Effect? It's things like this that make or break a setting for me. The presence of Deadpool doesn't change his surroundings. He's only real in a very secluded, roped off section of freaks. There's this one part where he jumps out of a garbage truck after using it as a free ride, and the driver doesn't even bat an eye. He's a dude dressed from head to toe in red, and he's got swords strapped to his back. What is he, your friendly neighborhood kook? Who are you? You know who I am. I do. Deadpool, Marvel anti-hero extraordinaire. He's so ordinary in this setting that he might as well not be the costume freak he parades himself around as. Hell, even Saitama prompts mothers to drag their children away from him. Hey, you know what did the superpowered freak in a normal setting format really well? The first half of Hancock. You know what did the superpowered freak in a normal setting format very poorly? The second half of Hancock. You know what did a superhero infused setting extremely well? Not to fillet Japan's teeny weeny any more than I already have, but Tiger and Bunny is one of the few superhero stories I genuinely love. And that's because his world building is its bread and butter. In Tiger and Bunny, heroes are so mainstream they're reality TV stars, and their shtick is taking out bad guys for TV ratings and points that essentially preserve their careers. Their positions in the show dictate their ability to get sponsorships by companies, even real life ones like Pepsi, Bandai, and Amazon. By the by, this is how you do product placement folks, instead of having a character randomly bring up TJI Fridays because Haha, <laughs> real world references are funny. They have a wonderful TGI Friday. <laughs> My favorite part of Tiger and Bunny is that if the heroes accrue property damage, their sponsors have to pay out of pocket for it. A small detail, but it's what sold me on watching the rest of the show. This all takes place in a fictionalized version of New York City, called Stern Build City. And just look at it, it's fucking cool! And better yet, the characters, in fact, live in it. You have Kotetsu Kaburagi, or Wild Tiger, a veteran superhero who's just struggling to keep his job with his fading popularity, and a sponsor company being taken over thanks to the collateral damage costs he's racked up. He's one of the older heroes amongst his peers, a romantic with old school ideas about heroism, who's being left behind by a changing, more competitive work environment, with its photo shoots and posturing and the commercialization of his childhood aspirations. But he's also a lovable, scatterbrained goofball who's trying to maintain a relationship with his younger daughter, whom he adores. And as he balances all this, he must deal with his new upstart partner at work, Barnaby Brooks, or Bunny, the quintessential young go-getter superhero, complete with a tragic backstory and everything. They're polar opposites, which makes their dynamic, the focus focus of the show, so entertaining to watch. It's not a perfect show, far from it, with certain plot lines that go nowhere and a lackluster ending, but it's up there, and I can't recommend it enough. See? I can be positive. I love things. I swear. One more thing. The crazy power level variability. Yes, MCU fans have to pretend that guys like the Punisher are on par with heroes like Doctor Strange. As if the former is not some vigilante asshole with a pea shooter, and the latter is not a super sorcerer who staves off extra dimensional beings of evil. You'd think Edgemeister here would be totally irrelevant to the grand scheme of things, unless he can riddle a nigh omnipotent monster of psychic energy with bull- <laughs> It's like how I simply cannot take Black Widow seriously. Her power is little baby glocks. At least Hawkeye has fucking explosives. I'm always picking up after you boys. Fuck Black Widow so much. I want to hear one more sardonic little comment out of her stupid little mouth. Did I step on your moment? Yes you did, bitch! But you never see them getting wrecked for being, you know, 
mortals and a sandbox of fucking demigods. In fact, they seem even more competent than the gods at times, as if to conceal the fact that they should be dragging everybody else down because they don't have superpowers. Now, One Punch Man has similar power level variability with its hero ranking system, where you have crazy powerful psychics like Tatsumaki in S class, all the way down to a guy riding his bike in C class. Here's the difference. What happens when Tatsumaki takes a monster head on? What happens when a certain unlicensed rider takes some bald socialists on? <laughs> With Deadpool, like I said in part one, everybody's just about equally competent in bad guy take downery, except there's slightly more girl power at play. I prefer not to hit a woman, so please. There's no parody, there's no real stakes, there's just nothing interesting here. Go ahead and try and hit me if you're able. <sighs> Moving on. Comedy. This one's gonna be quick because this is easily one of the more subjective elements. And while subjectivity is the biggest get out of jail free card there ever was, that's another topic for another video. I assert that Deadpool is not that funny. You only work for that shit spackled Muppet fart! Now, don't get me wrong, those opening title credits were amusing. The character's carefree quips when he's taking out dudes are chuckle-worthy. His interactions with Colossus and Negasonic dies to scum are gold. But his narration and the scenes where he runs his mouth on random tangents in an attempt to sound halfway clever, Deadpool loses me there. And he does these a lot. See, the comedy with Deadpool is mostly that Deadpool is a comedian. Bring him up. Okay. Hey, ho, 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 Hakuna has taught us. He talks and talks and talks until something he says will prompt a laugh or at least a light chuckle, and there you have it. Funny. I don't mind the Kunin. It's an improvement on the Hurdal, please. I think it's an improvement over the Hurdal. I'd have taken an Amnes or, or, or a Trisol over the Hurdal. Oh, no, I didn't get excited until I saw the Kunin. One Punch Man goes for a slightly different angle. The comedy with Saitama is that his very presence breaks every scenario he's put in, and that he's tragically bored during all of it. I plainly think that this is cleverer by far, and that it requires more setup for more payoff. But doesn't the joke get old? It's the same thing every time, right? That Saitama's too strong? Yes, that is the joke. Every single time. And if One Punch Man hadn't played its cards right, it would have gotten real old, real fast. Luckily, Saitama makes up only a fraction of the show's run Time. Instead, One Punch Man has the cunning to not focus solely on him, but a fair bit on the surrounding cast. For instance, a lot of the internal monologuing in the show is not done by Saitama, but by Genos, or Speed of Sound Sonic, or Bang, or really just about anybody else when the show can get away with it. Even the characters that show up once and never again, who were scared shitless by threats that Saitama wouldn't even blink at. Because these characters have a concrete stake in this world, so the show focuses disproportionately on them. As the show progresses and the threats escalate, and become more dangerous, they are the ones most affected, not Saitama. They are the setup. Saitama is just the one punchline. One, one punchline? Yes, yes, I'm a master of comedy. That's just my thoughts on that. You can disagree if you want, but then you'd be wrong. What is that? That's the shit emoji. You know, it's the turd with the smiling face and the eyes. I thought it was chocolate yogurt for so long. <laughs> so, so funny. But some of the best love stories start with a murder. And that's exactly what this is. A love story. It's garbage! Here's the romance in Deadpool. Hi, I am quirky. Hello, I am also similarly quirky like yourself. Perhaps even more so. I also fuck strangers for money. Can I get a discount? And then they bang, okay? They bang a lot. Well, this is as real depiction of a modern day relationship I've ever seen put to film, which is why it's boring. I'm being a bit facetious, but it really is boring. For one thing, I don't really know why these two are attracted to one another, aside from them both being attractive people. All they did was trade some one-liners. Romance. For another, she pegs him in the ass. Her <laughs> because it was International Why Minds Day. It's funny because modern men might as well be castrated. It's incredibly refreshing to see a female character in a superhero movie like this um, that is just as strong, you know, as the guy is. <laughs> Kind of amazing for the first time to see a, a character like this in a superhero movie. You can throw down with the boys. I'm going to pepper spray you in the face. That's what I'm going to do to you. I got him! 
just as strong as the guy is. Remember when men were the men in relationships? By the time, <laughs> by the time I put on the strap on, yeah, was behind Ryan, we were fairly comfortable with each other at that point. I, I, well, so, I, mean, I so wish you were kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me fucking neither. I guess this is all supposed to be subversion of the usual romance plot in superhero films, where it takes the entire movie for the superhero to get the girl, whereas Deadpool just bangs her immediately because whores. Or well, she bangs him. Here's the romance in One Punch Man. <laughs> Genos best waifu. Of these two, which do you think has a happier ending? If you chose Deadpool unequivocally, you'd be right. Deadpool's ending is disgustingly happy and subverts nothing at all. He stops the bad guy in an admittedly humorous way, gets the girl, doesn't get his face, but luckily it's one of those you wasted everybody's time because what really mattered was inside you all along bullshit endings. In fact, his girlfriend doesn't even care about his fugly face. Yeah, right. And so he suddenly doesn't care either. Yeah, fucking right. Then the camera pulls back and Deadpool tells us what a happy ending it all is. Literally, he tells us. Who doesn't love a happy ending, huh? Contrast this with One Punch Man, where the ending has the top heroes locked in combat with a regenerating alien monster. While unbeknownst to them, Saitama faces Lord Boros, the first threat to not have gone down with a single punch. What follows is one of the most epic showdowns put to TV animation. Has Saitama finally met his match? Nah. Turns out, Saitama was holding back all along to give this guy the fight of his life, the thrill he himself so desperately craves. Boros was never a threat. He wasn't even a challenge, as Boros wretchedly realizes moments before his own demise. Saitama is just too powerful. While the show ends on a handful of hopeful and comedic notes, it's tinged with a taste of bittersweetness, because ultimately, nothing's really changed for Saitama. Probably nothing ever will. God, it's like the whole thing was subverted. You know what's really hard? Creating a fictional world that feels unique but lived in. Populated with relatable but exceptional people, with fantastic problems that are somehow believable. And during all of this, persuading audiences, if only for a little while, to forget that what they're seeing isn't real. You know what's really easy? Placing characters in a box and having them point to the fourth wall and say, I was just bullshitting you this whole time. But you already knew that, didn't you? One Punch Man made me smile, made me laugh, got me pumped up and excited, and it even made me tear up. This scene right here warmed a heart I never knew I had. Deadpool gave me whiplash. In one scene it would be throwing back the curtain to proudly display how meta and self-aware it all was, but then in the next, Wade has cancer now and no he's not parodying how tired and cliched such an original story is, he's taking himself super seriously, and it's supposed to be sad and tragic and emotional and <laughs> wait, now he's killing bad guys with reckless abandon and oh, now he's depressed about his terminal case of forever alone mug and oh well, he's moving the camera away and pointing out studio constraints. But, oh no, his girl got kidnapped and now he's forgotten the audience can see how he's genuinely upset about it. Deadpool made me confused as it broke the fourth wall and then as quickly as it happened, pretended it didn't exist. It promised me one thing. You're probably thinking, my boyfriend said this was a superhero movie. Well, I may be super, but <laughs> I am no hero. And then unknowingly gave me the opposite. Maybe super, but <laughs> I am no hero. Are you sure about that? It delighted in its ball jokes and colorful cursing and raunchiness and off-color glib obscenity. Language, please. And then asked me to care about its crude caricatures as if they were real people. Deadpool left me bitter and unsatisfied.
The reason I was so floored by One Punch Man was because it took a genre that I find intrinsically lazy and it flipped it on its head to make a fun and, above all, smart action comedy. Deadpool, however, was just a nihilistic reiteration of superhero themes and tropes, so enchanted by its own meta insight that it forgot to provide any real depth. One Punch Man will be remembered fondly as a tongue-in-cheek love letter to a genre beloved by many, the caped baldy standing on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> あはははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははははは